Hi everyone, it's Jerry. This is Game 8 from the 2018 World Chess Championship match. Challenger Fabiano Caruana has the white pieces in this one against Magnus Carlsen. And we remain level. Three and a half points apiece in this race to six and a half. Each player still in search of their first decisive result. And this game really could not have started off in a sharper way. Right out of the opening. Queenside, center, kingside, all relevant with a nice mix of both strategic and tactical ideas throughout. So how did it begin? Well, Caruana stuck to his guns, yet to deviate from 1e4, and Carlson yet to deviate from his reply. Yet another Sicilian defense. Now, in games 1, 3, and 5, we saw... Bishop b5 at this moment, entering a Rosalimo. This time around, in game 8, it's an open Sicilian. d4 is present. And we have a Zveshnikov striking. Very committal. Double edge, call it what you want. Direct play. Committal decision. With this one pawn move, two big gaps are now created in black's camp. White is now eyeing up one of them, looking to drop in. Black defends against that. The queen is now there to assist. And most popular on this move 7 is to play bishop g5. Just a note or two about this move. Its aim is to knock out a key defender of this weakened d5 square, and then occupy the d5 square with, not just any piece, a knight. Okay, well, in this game, it's not bishop g5, but rather knight d5, forcing this capture, as otherwise one of these two moves will be painful. So the knight goes, and white recaptures, not with the queen. Queen has no business being there. It will be flushed back soon enough. Pawn takes knight. Knight drops back home, looking to reroute by way of d7. So, about this position, what can I say? Well, majorities have been created with this last capture. White, on the queen side, has a 4-3 to three majority. Similar ratio tipping in black's favor on the king side. Each side will look to advance their majority. One day, each side hopes to create a pawn that is passed. Bear that in mind, this will help us to understand the why behind certain moves and the when. Also, if there is one piece, or excuse me, one pawn in this position that has a big responsibility, it's this pawn on d6. What is its responsibility? Stay there. If it is distracted from d6, white has, would then have, a passed pawn. And the move d6 is a back-breaking move. How do I know this? My back has been broken many times. The limited experience I've had with this variation is black. When white gets in d6, it's very painful. Not only is this passed pawn that much closer to queening, but the simple, uh, you know, vacating uh, the, the d5 square, when it is vacated, it can be made use of many times by multiple white pieces, a knight, a queen, a bishop, many times hitting with great effect. Bear this in mind. It's important. Okay, from here, a4 on board. White is getting the majority rolling on the queen side some. White is anticipating that one day the knight will be a great bother to black and black will give the knight a shove. And so when a6 is in, white is near by for the a5 advance, clamping down on a created weakness, b6. From here, some emphasis on the king side. Next couple moves. Kings are tucked away. There's not a better square for the knight. Bishop d2. Looks like one of those half-developing moves off the back rank. It only took a step. What is it really doing? 
Well, it's looking to assist in the defense of the pawn when it is on a5. If white tries to play first a5, b4, bishop to d2, what would be the problem? Well, if a5 right now, black at this very moment would ask the knight a question. And where would it go? If it goes to c3, it looks like a nice square, key 16 squares, but wait, it's getting in the way of the c2 pawn that wants to move. The majorities want to roll. And if it goes to a3, it obstructs the rook in defending the a pawn. The queen can win the pawn. Therefore, bishop d2 first, securing the pawn when it is on a, when it is on a5, so that knight a3 is available when the knight is kicked. From here, what's black doing? Black's getting his majority rolling. f5 on board. Oh, and another thing, now that f5 is in, remember that d6 advance? Now, if it gets in at some point, and a queen or a bishop is able to get there, it's hitting with check. From here, a5, a6, and where does the knight go? a3, looking to circle in to this newly created uh, weakness and also exert great pressure on the black center. From here, a couple different directions at least this game could go. It's such a sharp game, I could only really scratch the surface with some of the variations I share. Um, in this game, e4 is played. Now, this move, uh, it, it follows the general rule, which says you ought to move your candidate past pawn first. Uh, the e pawn in this case is considered the candidate past pawn because it has no counterpart. And given enough moves, uh, white, or excuse me, black will be able to one day have what? A passed E pawn. The E pawn is the candidate passed pawn. Now, why exactly should you move? Again, this is just a general rule. Why should you go with a candidate passed pawn first before, let's say, playing F4? If you play F4 first, that leaves a great gap on e4 and sometimes this is a square uh, your opponent can take advantage of you know white can try to take great control over that square get a knight there it's something that can backfire if you do it in the wrong order now that said the move f4 is also an interesting move that i want to draw some attention to even though it gives up e4 it permits a very interesting idea for black. Now, what is it permitting? Well, this caveman-like idea. So, just going to have a little fun here, sharing you what, sharing with you this caveman-like idea. What am I talking about? Well, we have this rook lift to f6. This rook up. Pewter suggest I think b4 here. Rook over. Note what the rook is doing. Looking to crash through on h2, well, combined with the queen, it also adds some nice lateral defense to d6. It doesn't yet budge with the knight on d7. There's a little battle going on over f6. But this is a plan, believe it or not, for black. It looks pretty crazy to do this rook lift, but soon there's queen h5. It's very scary. It's a direction this game could possibly go. Kind of crazy, <laughs> but yeah, these ideas, this, this position is rich with many ideas. This is just one of them. Anyhow, in this game, Carlson sticks with the general rule, candidate pass pawn first, also vacating e5 for the knight. Knight c4, and this is met with knight e5 on the next turn. Uh, notice also the clock times. This may factor into uh, the, the decisions by Carlson. It seems that, yet again, Carwan is the one who is a bit more prepared for this line. He pretty much has not blinked yet. Uh, still 100 minutes, about. And it may be a wise choice for Black not to go down some super sharp line 
White is probably prepared for it. Uh, the move that would scare me in this position, and I think a move that should scare every chess player, honestly, is the move F4. What exactly would be the reply to F4? I don't know. Uh, I let this one sit for a while with the engine. It jumps around with a lot of different ideas, moving the bishop a couple ways, F3, rookie one, it even came up with. Let's just say rookie one, trying to target a new weakness. Right now that this is in, maybe you could get there. What's the big issue? What would make me feel so uncomfortable if black acquires this uh, duo on my fourth rank? Well, I know that this is going to be painful at some stage. This I know that f3 is going to break open white's kingside, even if it costs a pawn. Look at the squares that are now created, the gaps that are created in white's camp. Now, I think this position can go anyway. It feels like a, a position where whoever has let their computer sit long enough and whoever has done more homework on this position will come away with a W. Even though right now it's saying white is a little bit better, it's just that type of position. It's just so sharp. I don't know how play would continue from here. It is another path, another environment we could have. In this game, 95 straight away. Now, it is important for white at this stage not to take the knight. If you take the knight, it's true you would get a passed pawn, but this is not a pawn that's posing any serious threat at the moment to black, and it's one that could pretty much be stopped cold with bishop to d6. So, for example, let's just say it's saying bishop to c4 at this point, but gets in the way of this pawn. It's difficult to get the majority rolling for white in this uh with with this structure and nearby are these ideas still of f4 and f3 i think white would uh be pretty crazy to allow that kind of pawn mass on the king's side so no knight takes knight knight b8 instead rook b8 and now white does something to challenge these two pawns playing f4 himself now, Black's reply, definitely one that will make plenty of chess players, uh, well, plenty of new players of the game, scratch their head. Black captures on f3 on Passan, and White recaptures with the bishop. Sometimes you can see, not saying in this exact position, but there are reasons sometimes to capture with the pawn and voluntarily split your kingside structure. That's a big decision. The point being to challenge one day black's best piece with f4. There's no guarantee that you could get that in, right? Black could maybe play f4 right here. But sometimes this is an idea. If you could get in f4, maybe you split up your structure. Not in this game. White uh, places an emphasis on king safety. Keeps this nice cozy blanket for his king. Speaking of uh, cozy blankets. <laughs> um, Carlson basically with his next move says, I don't need a blanket. I am going all in. For you poker fans, this is the all in move. G5 on board. Doesn't get much more committal than this. Throwing in all his chips. Four weaknesses have been created and there's no repairing them. White has the safer king in this position. Play continues with c4. So, I mean, g5 is once more getting some majority rolling. Maybe f4 first, maybe g4. In this game, it is what? Yet again, we have the candidate passed pawn going first. Going with the other pawn, g4. Look at the gap on f4. I think we do one better to describe majorities as healthy or unhealthy. I believe this would now be an unhealthy kingside majority for black. Difficult to have their presence felt. F4. How do you get that in? White has nice control over that square. This pawn remains backward. If this pawn can't move, what's this bishop going to do? The bishop on c8 is a struggling piece. 
this is yet another point behind F4 on move 19. Just like E4 opened up the E5 square for the knight, F4 is opening up the F5 square for the bishop. So from here, bishop to C3, some pressure on the knight. And uh, this is where we have about a 20-minute think. Carlson ends up playing bishop f5. And the follow-up is now c5. And this c5 move takes about 35 minutes. Um, another move that Carlson was probably considering here is one that interferes with the c5 advance. So a move that would do that is queen c7. However, white can play b4. White doesn't need to uh, address this threat on c4. There is a good reply should black go pawn hunting. So let me play out a couple moves should that be the case. Knight takes c4 in this position can be met with knight takes bishop. And then this light square bishop turns into a great animal. The e6 square is great, and the rook is under fire. White is for choice here. So that could be a big problem. White could uh, ignore, basically, this threat against c4, play b4, and uh, nearby is even a capture and then a push, getting the majority rolling. Looking forward to this advance. In reply to queen c7 capturing straight away, this structure, difficult to get the majority rolling. There are some weaknesses. One might describe this as a bit of an unhealthy majority if you can't get these moves in. Dark square weaknesses for uh, white on the queen side. So anyhow, in this game, queen c7 was not played. Bishop f5, one of the top moves by the engine. d3 is a, a square that maybe a piece can jump into it's not a concern for white white gets on with c5 a lot of time invested on that move again about 35 minutes uh, another move is to maybe back up anticipating that you know if if g4 is in then uh, the f pawn may fall what do we have here in this game c5 there is no pawn takes pawn the knight would fall so black first takes out the bishop and only then wins the pawn on c5. So let's just pause for a moment. What's the body count? Black is up a pawn. But that extra pawn is not felt in this position. It's not really contributing. Where is that extra pawn exactly? I guess we would say it's the f pawn. But uh, this pawn right now, you'll know after this capture, is mobile, is now passed, and will consume black. It must capture black's attention, this guy here. White is very close to advancing it, and in this particular case, a queen move, or maybe even a knight move, will turn out to be a great bother. Also, note the power of the bishop on c3. It super glues everything in on the queen side. Excellent coordination and can't speak highly enough of this piece. It's both a great defender and attacker, knifing into Black's camp. So what do we have from here? Well, first of all, Black makes sure this pawn does not budge. After rook a to d1, looking for this advance, Black blockades. Bishop d6. In this position, if you do not blockade, just to point out how serious this move is, let's just make a nothing move to show, d6 is going to hurt, right? And after a capture, there's this stuff. Check, and what is the queen not hitting? The bishop will fall next. And if bishop to f6, this is just not a position to play. Eventually, the, the dark square bishops will be exchanged. The rook slips into the seventh rank. It feels like black is only playing on what, like three ranks? White is playing on five. Not a good position for team black. K4 
Can't let that pawn move. Black stops it cold. Bishop d6. Move 24. White has an advantage here. A serious advantage. Something we haven't really seen much of in this match. Something that's beyond one point at the moment right now. It's saying 1.27. And I imagine it will continue to grow if I let it sit for some more. A serious advantage here for white. On move now, Caruana spends about seven minutes. Ends up playing h3. I'm not quite sure how to describe this move. Uh, it appears as though white kind of takes his foot off, off the gas pedal with h3. There is a much more direct approach, much more aggressive way forward for black, or excuse me, for white in this position, instead of playing this cautious h3 preventative, I guess, uh, move h3. Uh, preventing g4, I don't really see this as like a flight square in this position. I see it more so as interfering with the g4 advance. What is a better move to uh, consider, at least? Uh, knight c4? for one, is a move that would put pressure on the bishop and tie down the queen and basically the rook. A knight on c4 really restricts the whole queen side, let's say, for black. This would create some imbalance elsewhere in the board, the king side in particular. Now, a problem that may arise for white, if knight c4 is played on move 24, instead of h3, is that g4 can be played. And it could be a bit tricky now for white. Where exactly to go with the queen? What kind of pawn break will black go forward with? Is there f3? Is there g3? The computer says maybe you could play one of those two. It gets complicated from there. There's a couple different pawn breaks that are in the air should white play knight c4. Now having said that, there is a move white could play that would sidestep g4 with tempo. And that is the move queen h5, considered one of the best moves. This uh, avoids g4 with tempo. This looks to coordinate very well with the bishop that is not contested on the main diagonal. Right, the bishop would like to offset it, but it already has a, a priority. Stop this guy from moving. So while the, the bishop is preoccupied as a blockader, white can look for checkmate on g7. Now, it's not something that's clear-cut by any means, but this is a direction white ought to go. Move the queen into h5, and I'd like to play out a few moves to show you the type of... Uh, uh, the strong position white can uh, get to. Bishop g6, queen here, mate threat. Not too many ways you could defend against that. Let's say rook f7 and rook f to e1. I mean, we could play out a few more moves, but eventually we're getting to a point where the white pieces, every one of white's pieces, is excellent. What does black do here? Follow-up moves for white, rook to e6, what is the rook not doing? I don't see how black survives this position. Not the variation we go, uh, we, don't, we don't go down that path. Some time spent on h3, seven minutes roughly. Notice Carlson's reply, basically didn't blink. I think there was a great relief on his part at this moment when he saw h3. Queen to e8 is now stopping queen to h5. Queen e8 is looking to reposition and finally uh, the rook is also there to help out in defending against uh, you know, defending the d6 square should there be some pressure placed on it with knight to c4. From here knight c4 queen g6 Knight takes bishop. If white tries to activate the rook in this position, well, notice not only is the queen defending the bishop, but 
the queen is facilitating a g4 advance. I'm not saying this is a best move, but it's nearby. Maybe good. What's, what's the reply here? It's complicated. Queen is doing more than just one thing from g6. So the knight takes the bishop, distracts the queen away from this possibility, and white takes this shot to break up the dark square pawns. Opposite color bishop ending, white wants to activate this guy somehow. Break down the dark squares, h4 on board. The reply is g takes h4, trying to maintain this structure with h6. Really isn't a good idea because white can get to this h5 square and the computer says it's around equal. But you don't enter this position if you're playing as black. This queen, the white queen, is simply way out of control, way too active. So no h6 here. g takes h4. Now f4 is picked up. But the queens are off. And we have an opposite color bishop ending. White is the one trying for something in this endgame. Still with this passed pawn. What do we have material-wise? Four, four pawns to five. White is the better side. This one pawn on g2 restricts these guys. How exactly to advance this pawn? Also, h4 is under fire. Black does not try to defend it, does not play h3 at this moment. Instead, h5 saying, if you take my pawn, I'm going to make life difficult for your rook. Now, in the game, rook e1. If rook takes h4, this is annoying. It's not losing or anything, but it's going to cost some tempi now uh, before white activates the rook on h4. There's no disrupting this link on g4, h5. The way out is to play rook, eight, rook h1, king h2, and then finally go somewhere. Okay, white does not want to be inconvenienced like that and says, I'm not taking h4. Let me get my rooks involved. And nearby, for white, is rook e5. This can be a big problem for black, even though the queens are off the board. You put a rook on g7, great things can happen fast for white. Connecting very well with the bishop on c3. From here, bishop g4. Offering a rook exchange pretty much can't be avoided. There isn't a great, I mean, you could double rooks, but then this rook can get active some. Computer suggesting b5, possibilities for b4. And on a capture, yeah, the rooks are, uh, both, both sets of rooks are active in this endgame. From here, one rook is going to be exchanged. Rook f6. Rook takes, bishop takes, white's ready to pick up h4 with the bishop. A much more convenient piece uh, to capture on h4 than a rook. Now, very tempting at this moment right here for black, I must say, is the move h3. h3, its aim to do what exactly? Well, exchange off one of these doubled pawns for the g2 pawn, h3 would be a losing move. I'd like to illustrate why that would be the case. If h3 is played in this position, first of all, a bad follow-up would be to first capture. So let me do this bad follow-up. And then go in here. Why is this not as precise as immediately going in for rook to e7, getting on the seventh rank? Let's see why. It's not as precise. Black can play rook f8. And this check, king here, there are no good discovered checks for white after the bishop backs up. In this position, black has one saving move, rook to g8, and the rooks will be forced off because there is a pin. If we go back to this point right here, Suppose the pawn is not captured. 
and white goes straight in for this. Notice how things are different. Check, king here, bishop c3. There is no rook g8 as a save, getting rid of the rook. And white is going to have a lot of fun in this position, ready to move the rook wherever he wants, and it will be check. This is a one position for team white. Computer is suggesting bishop f5. There's rook check on f7. The rook can always return. You could take, excuse me, on b7. Come back for a check. Play d6. Play d7. There's no good solution here, so just playing it out a little bit more. d7. And you basically have to just capture now. The threat is to get a queen. It's one way to do it. You could get a queen and then play here, pick up the loose piece. What I'm getting at with this long-winded long -winded variation in the endgame is h3 is a lemon because of the follow-up rook to the seventh rank. Coordinating still, there's just two pieces, but if the rook can coordinate with the bishop on g7, it can be a big problem for team black. In this game, Carlson recognizes that, steps up with the king. Bishop takes h4. Black offers a rook exchange, knows he's not any better in this position. White keeps a rook on. A rook must be maintained, otherwise there is absolutely nothing to play for. King g8, rook f6. Black is now active. Rook e2, check thrown in. The pawn marches, and this pawn right here on b2 is poison. Move 37 is rook to d2. If rook takes b2, white to move, pop quiz, what would be the winning continuation? Feel free to pause the video. Okay. If in this position Carlson captured on b2, the winning shot is to knock out the bishop and then push the pawn. You have to give up the rook eventually to stop it. White goes on to win this ending. Carlson, of course, sees that, plays rook to d2, making sure this pawn will not go any further. d7 is under control. Next move, move 38, rook g5. There's nothing more to play for in this endgame. Opposite color bishops, no progress to be made. Rook g5 was played with a draw offer, and it was accepted. What a game we had. Uh, at the press conference in this one, I saw a photo of these two, and I got the definite impression that Caruana really knew he let something slip away here. And, yeah, Carlson looked like he, you know, he had nine lives. He knew he really dodged a bullet in this one. Queen to h5. If that move was played on move 24 instead of h3, this could have been the first decisive result. This was the first real chance, I feel, for Caruana to score that point. We're going to see how this one develops. We, are, we remain locked, but what a game this one was. Zveshnikov, Sicilian, are we going to have another Zveshnikov at some point? Maybe a game 12? If it's still level at that point and Caruana does not want to enter the Rapids, maybe he's going to go for it with this variation. Or excuse me, another Zveshnikov, but maybe Bishop G5? We're going to see what happens. Uh, somebody is, again, going to have to fall. We are locked 4-4 four to four going into round 9. So, tail the tape on this one. Where do we stand? This is what it's looking like in an inaccuracy, an inaccuracy a piece, and a leverage uh, eleven, excuse me, eleven average centi pawn loss for each side. So clear advantage right around this stage. Once g5 was in that all in type move, big advantage, and after bishop d6, really thrown away with that h3 move and. Some nice defensive moves in that endgame from Carlson from then on. Had his chances, and yeah, well, Carlson had chances in round one. Caruana, realistic chances in this round eight. 
we're going to see how it all unfolds. These are the top two guys in the world, and it's it's really a fantastic match. So accurate. How long can it be maintained? We're going to find out. Okay. As usual, feel free to leave any feedback to this video in the comment section below. I hope you enjoyed it and maybe took a thing or two away. That's all for now. Take care.